Welcome to Behind the Dark Lens. I'm your host, Olga Medvedev-Young. Our guest today is Liz Kanner, an award-winning director. Kanner was named one of the top 10 independent filmmakers to watch by Independent Magazine. Since 1991, she has received more than 60 awards, honors, and grants for her innovative documentary projects on human rights issues. Kanner's documentaries have been broadcast on PBS and cable stations locally and internationally. She's here to share some insight on her powerful film, Orgasm, Inc. This is Behind the Dark Lens. All of my life, I've had difficulty achieving orgasm. It's a secret epidemic that 43% of American women experience sexual dysfunction. 40 million women in the United States alone may be affected by female sexual dysfunction. Female sexual dysfunction probably runs 83%. This is a very new field of medicine, but there's a good chance the problem can be tackled. Vivas wanted me to put together an erotic video for use during the testing of their new drug. Now you'll be going to the sensory testing room where the physician will monitor blood flow to the genitals. Little did I know that I would spend nine years documenting the medical industry's attempt to change our understanding of the meaning of health, illness, desire, and orgasm. The market out there is large. People would buy it. We're all in a race to see who can be first to market. Your total today is 1500 We take cash, check, or charge. There's a lot of money to be made telling healthy people they're sick. It's not a disease. Is a drug going to help them? Maybe if it has a map of the clitoris on the box. Health costs are already exploding. Drug companies have been involved in redefining and designing conditions. I see today as a perilous moment in the history of women's sexuality. So when the FDA said yes, Yes. It started a gold rush as inventors searched for cures. We're going to call the device the orgasmatron. The electrode is threaded up the spinal cord. And then by adjusting the electrical parameters, you will have an orgasm. Ooh. Oh, that's too strong. You use the laser to make an incision. You're able to push the bladder back up to where normally, in a young person, it would be making it tighter. My doctor said that I lost about a third of my blood volume. There was a possibility of me dying. Sex it was heady days, though. I mean, you watch the stock price go up every day. We didn't even know what the disease was. How did female sexual dysfunction come to be as a disease? We don't know. At least give me enough time to find a new job be before you air this. <laughs> Joining me now is Liz Kanner. Liz, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. It's our pleasure. So let's talk about Orgasm, Inc. How did this idea, how did this film come about? Well, basically, I have been producing documentaries for about a decade on human rights issues, on things like um, police brutality and genocide. And I was starting to get really depressed about the state of humanity. And I was beginning to get nightmares of things like police brutality. So I thought, you know, I want to change my dreams. I want to ha start to have pleasant dreams. So I started researching what medicine had said about women and sexuality and conception and pleasure um, for about 2,000 years. And there were all these really fascinating scientific theories that changed over time as we understood how the body functioned better. And so I was in the middle of shooting this historical documentary when out of the blue eyes offered this job by uh, Vivas, a pharmaceutical company, to help them put together erotic videos for them to use in the clinical trials of a new drug that they were developing that was an orgasm drug that they were trying to create for a disease called female sexual dysfunction. So you're editing erotic videos for you know, female pleasure. So talk about Vivas and their involvement and, and basically what they're all about. I think after Viagra, this, there was this thought that these sorts of drugs were going to work on women. Um, Viagra was this huge blockbuster drug in the late 90s, and so the drug industry turned to women and said there's a bigger market here. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that Vivas was developing a product. They, they already had a product called Muse that was available for men for erectile dysfunction, and they thought that the same sort of thing would have a positive effect on women, that if you gave women genital engorgement that they would be having fabulous orgasms. 
Um, and so they needed these videos in order to test the drug in the doctor's offices. And I asked them if I could film them um, because I thought, okay, this, is, this will be amazing. This actually works. This is going to change things for people. Um, and as I was filming and asking very basic questions, I was getting very unusual responses. And that made me curious. One of the things uh, that happens when you develop a drug is that you need to have a disease in order to be cured. Right, to work on it. The FDA requires that. So if you're going to make a pharmaceutical, you have to be able to define what the illness is so that you can then show when the person has actually been cured. As I'm watching this, I'm seeing that perhaps, you know, some women think that they have a disease and it's actually been classified as female sexual dysfunction. Talk about FSD and where it came from and why all of a sudden so many women are afflicted by FSD. I learned that term when I was working on the videos because we had to put up these screens at the beginning of the video that says that said, because you're participating in this study, you have female sexual dysfunction, was basically what these screens said. And then it went on to say that 43% of women suffer from this disorder. And here I had done tons of research and I'd never come across that term. And if 43% of women suffered from it, why weren't my friends talking about it? Why hadn't my mother told me about it? Why didn't we learn I about mean, sex I mean, that's ed? almost half of the female population. And so then I started to look into it more. And there were some psychiatrists, there were sex therapists. There was actually, it turned out, a whole group of people that were trying to look at this critically. Uh, Leonor Tiefer is one of the key people who I feature in my documentary. She was a professor at NYU. And they were trying to show that female sexual dysfunction was actually something that the pharmaceutical industry had been involved with defining. So they're out there doing all of this research and they're actually, you know, talking to women about FSD and Ray Moynihan actually, someone who's kind of blatantly against it and doesn't really believe that it exists, you know, shows what those survey results were based on. It was a very sort of general, general. survey. And then what happened was in the late 90s as a way to sort of justify the fact that there was going to be a big market here for these drugs. That data was used in a Journal for the American Medical Association article and it was used to actually define the amount of women that had female sexual dysfunction. You so, know, it's, it's really frustrating because it's not that hard to convince somebody who isn't orgasming that there's something wrong with you. Is FSD a real disease? The drug industry basically funded the first meetings where female sexual dysfunction was defined. The 18 of the 19 doctors who came up with the definition, which is extremely broad, it basically includes any sexual complaint that you might have, from not orgasming quickly enough, to having pain during intercourse, to not having enough sexual desire, very sort of vague kinds of things. Um, they came up with this very broad definition. 18 of the 19 doctors had ties to 22 drug companies who came up with that definition. And so the thing that I show in Orgasm Inc. is that the majority of women's sexual problems come from things like past sexual abuse. They come from things like hysterectomies, which can lower libido. They come from uh, some women who have diabetes may have sexual problems. So there's a few medical conditions, but that's a very small part of the population. A big one is communication problems with yeah, your partner. There are so many other factors like stress, like you might have a job that you know weighs heavily on you. So you take all of those factors and perhaps you're not in the mood. Yet these pharmaceutical companies are saying that there's something wrong with you? They're trying to sort of make it seem like all of these problems are being caused by a biological problem that's physiologically wrong with you. Yeah. And they're stripping it of sort of the cultural context, the things that might be going on in your broader life that could be affecting your sexual experience. And it's a, the reason that they do this is because then it's much easier to say, well, we've got the drug that's going to fix that if it's a physiological problem. So let's talk a little bit more about this problem and reaping the benefits financially. Right. So they estimate that it's a multi-billion dollar market, um, the pharmaceutical industry, yeah. that is. And it's been fascinating sort of watching as these drugs are being prepared to go in front of the FDA for approval. Mm. And once they get approved, then they'll be released on the American market. But in order to actually make sure that there's a big market out there for these drugs, that there's going to be a lot of people that go to their doctor and demand them. And what's been very clear is that whichever drug gets approved, the pharmaceutical industry is going to try and change our understanding of what sexuality is, what pleasure is, based on that drug. So there was a drug called flibanserin 
that uh, was going up for approval that what had been the antidepressant, that it actually failed uh, during clinical trials. But what they discovered was that it seemed to be increasing women's libido. So they decided to change it around. It was being developed by Boring and Ingelheim, which is a German company. They decided to change around their clinical trials and start testing women with low desire. Mm. And then they decided to bring it in front of the FDA for approval. But no one had ever really thought about SSRIs or you know, things that affect dopamine and serotonin levels as something that would actually affect women's sexual desire. So in order to change the way that we were looking at this, they started a massive advertising campaign. Uh, people like Laura Berman, sex therapist Laura Berman, mm. started going on TV and talking about how low desire was a, was a serotonin endorphin problem, which in a way was trying to convince the American public that this product, once it's released, is going to be the cure-all for low desire. Uh, in the end, the documents were released. It turned out that it hadn't improved women's libido in Europe. Uh, and in the clinical trials in the United States, it had only given women 0.8 of a satisfying sexual event a month above placebo, only 0.8. And I don't know what a 0.8 of a satisfying sexual event is, but <laughs> clearly not a full satisfying sexual event. <laughs> And only compared to months. placebo. Right, compared to placebo. <laughs> see, that's part of the problem you see with these drugs is that yeah. the placebo effect is extremely high, which yeah. talks about it's the sort mental. of psychological yeah. right, element of it all. So, and that's actually another thing that the pharmaceutical industry has had trouble with is keeping people in their clinical trials. Because what they found is once people start talking to their doctor about it, they start to feel more comfortable about their sexual issues, they start to work on them more, become more kind of aware about talking to their partner about it, and things get better. There's a lot of risks involved. With, these, with all these drugs, it's health risks, major health risks. And some of them are... I mean, with phlebanserin, the health risks were things like headaches, passing out, um, feeling nauseous, things that really make you feel sexy. So um, if you pass out during sex, right, could you, you know... Right. Where's consent in that? <laughs> right. Um, so when phlebanserin actually went before the FDA, because the, the actual significant, you know, the benefit of it was not significant. So the FDA ended up not approving phlebanserin. Plus, the side effects were so extreme. They've been pushing testosterone, for instance. There's a lot of women taking testosterone off-label at this point because nothing's been approved by the FDA. Uh, the health risks of testosterone include things like breast cancer yeah. um, and cardiovascular problems. So these are serious drugs. The actual benefit has uh, not really been clinically proven in a way that any drug could get approved at this point. But there's this misconception out there that testosterone is a product that will help women um, with low desire, so a lot of doctors prescribe it in a way that's called off-label, which means that it's not actually something that's necessarily been approved by the FDA for this particular disease, but it still may work, the doctors think, so they'll prescribe it anyway. So Dr. Laura Berman discusses the off-label use of Viagra. Let's take a look at this clip. I was one of the principal investigators of the Viagra in women. At the halfway mark, Viagra, the favorite, is bringing up the rear. There's trouble on the track. Viagra is not working any better in clinical trials than sugar pills. So Pfizer yanks her from the competition. So would you recommend that doctors continue to prescribe Viagra for women? I still feel really strongly that Viagra and drugs like it, the vasodilators in general, which improve blood flow to the genital area, definitely have a role um, as part of a comprehensive treatment plan for women. Uh, the initial... Laura Berman is playing a dangerous game here. She's promoting the use of Viagra, even after Pfizer has found it does not work in women, and the health risks are unknown. Once a drug has been FDA approved for a particular condition, doctors can legally prescribe it for any disease. It's called off-label use. That said, it's illegal for pharmaceutical companies to promote off-label use of their drugs. So would you recommend that doctors continue to prescribe Viagra for women off-label? I do recommend it for women who have arousal problems, loss of sensation. Here is a senior figure Dr. Berman suggesting that doctors prescribe Viagra off-label, and yet Pfizer has called off the trials for Viagra in women. They can't show that Viagra has a, a meaningful benefit over, over sugar pills. It's a very subtle way to get around the approval process. Tell us about how important it is that there's activists out there that are trying to stop the FDA from approving these drugs. Well, unfortunately, Laura Berman which you find out in Orgasm Inc., was paid up to $75,000 a day to promote products on television and didn't mm. disclose this. And there's no law in our country that says that that's illegal. 
but there should be. There should be something that says if you're a medical expert and you go on TV and you pr promote a product, especially if it's off-label, which means it's never been clinically proven to work for that particular disease, and you're getting paid up to $75,000 a day, wow. you need to tell the public that because we don't know that. Yeah. When we're watching news and they bring on these medical experts, we are conditioned to trust experts, especially if they're wearing a white lab coat. So there's these activists that are definitely trying to stop this from happening and trying to bring awareness to situations like Laura Berman's. So people like Ray Moynihan and Leonor Tiefer have been trying to point out when this has been happening and really trying to keep the discussion about sexual problems open and honest and educational for people. Were you nervous about putting this film out there and the distribution? Were you nervous about certain repercussions? I think that we are told and in fact I was in, even interviewed by quite a few journalists that was, were surprised that I had the courage to make this film as an independent filmmaker because I think we're told that there's going to be very severe repercussions. Yeah. So in some ways there usually ends up being a lot of self-censorship but being reminded quite often that I could be at risk did actually make me maybe more afraid than I needed to be because in the end Orgasm Inc. has, there were some bumps in the road that's for sure but it has gotten out. Uh, it's been broadcast in 10 countries now. It's on Netflix and that kind of thing. So impressive. And can you give advice to filmmakers out there who are trying to you know, put a controversial topic out there? How do you deal with the repercussions? How do you find the courage to just go on and make it happen? Well, one thing that I was really lucky about was that I had an incredible lawyer, Rob Birchie, who worked with me on this. Um, he worked pro bono on the project for many years, and he's a brilliant lawyer. And he basically held my hand, I think, without him there to sort of say, yes, this is all legal. Everything you've done is, you know, you have all the releases. You have everything you need, you know, to say. And, and, this, and he was very clear at saying this information needs to get out to the American public. So I think having the support of somebody who really knows the laws is very important for documentary filmmakers. I don't think we can do our work without a really good lawyer standing by our side. Okay, that's a great tip, actually. And how were you able to get it on Netflix? Orgasm Inc. was theatrically released by First Run Features in the United States, and they have a uh, relationship with Netflix. Mm. Um, and so Net First Run Features really got it on Netflix. It's really, really impressive. I have to say this was such an informative film, and I, so many of us could learn something from this, especially as females. Oh, so thank, thank you, thank you yeah. for making this film happen, yeah. and good luck in the future, and good luck with the success of this film. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us on Behind the Dark Lens. Till next time, I'm Olga Medvedev-Young.